you're talking about secondary diabetes. Look how cute that is. I don't know where the microphone is. I'm going to look around the bottom. So now we're going to talk about some other things that can cause patients to have diabetes type symptoms. Uh, one of them is Cushing syndrome. And Cushing syndrome is a endocrine problem. Um, it's when they secrete an excessive amount of cortisol. And cortisol will cause the blood, blood glucose level to increase. It will also cause insulin resistance. And so they can develop diabetes. Uh, we talked about hyperthyroidism, and I just got a question about that a few minutes ago, so here's your answer. Hyperthyroidism causes your proteins to be broken down and converted to glucose, and also they have increased insulin resistance, so they can have some diabetes symptoms. Have y'all talked about parental nutrition in class yet? Uh -huh. Yes? Well, parental nutrition is high in glucose, and it can cause a patient to have diabetes symptoms. So while they're on parental nutrition, you have to monitor their blood glucose levels. So what the doctor will do is he'll order um, blood glucose levels, AC and HS before meals and at bedtime, and they'll cover them with sliding scale insulin. Also medications that can cause uh, the blood glucose level to go up, corticosteroids. How many of you have given medications like prednisone? In clinical, prednisone, solumedrol, corticosteroid drugs can cause the blood glucose level to, to go up. When I was working home health, I can remember vividly one patient that we had that uh, we were seeing her a couple of times a week just simply because she had been started on corticosteroids for some reason. I can't remember what the reason was. But we were monitoring her blood glucose level because it will make your blood glucose level go up. Fentoin. The other word for fentoin is dilantin. Dilantin can also cause the blood glucose level to go up, and some of your atypical antipsychotics can too. So um, just think about the fact that some medications can cause the blood glucose level to rise. Okay? Let's talk about the tests that are diagnostic for uh, diabetes. One is hemoglobin A1C. Do y'all know what the hemoglobin A1C is? That is a blood test that uh, they can draw blood and they can average the glucose over the last 20 days and it has to do with the life of the red blood cell because the uh, red blood cell has uh, hemoglobin in it and the uh, Glucose will attach itself to the hemoglobin molecule. And so the patient can go to the doctor and the doctor can say, how have your blood sugars been running in the morning? <coughs> and the patient may say, oh, they've been about 110, or never, never much higher than that. And then they do their hemoglobin A1C and it's maybe 9 or 10. They know that the patient's not telling the truth because it's the average blood glucose level over 120 days. So the normal is 4 to 6. The normal is 4 to 6 percent. Most doctors will not treat a patient, well, a type 2 diabetic, with any medication until their, blood, their hemoglobin A1C is greater than 7. If you have a patient that's stable, a diabetic that's stable, they, do, they usually do their hemoglobin A1C about twice a year. The fasting blood glucose level, uh, the normal is 100 milligrams per deciliter. When I was in nursing school, we were taught 80 to 120. Now they've lowered it to 100. Most of your doctors want it to be, want your blood, your fasting blood sugar to, or blood glucose level to be less than 100. Um, greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter on two different times is uh, indicative of a diagnosis of diabetes. Okay, a random blood glucose level. That's when they just randomly draw a blood glucose, no particular time, 
it's between meals. Uh, in the hospital, sometimes we call it a two-hour PC or a three-hour PC post-eating. Uh, it should be less than 200. Greater than 200 is indicative of diabetes. And then the glucose tolerance test, I think we talked about that a little bit ago. They do a glucose tolerance test to help them diagnose diabetes. They also do glucose tolerance tests on females uh, who are expecting a baby. Uh, this is really the best test for diagnosing diabetes. And if it's greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter, it's indicative of diabetes. Y'all need to know these, these um, ranges that I've given you because there's some questions on the test that you'll have to know these to be able to answer the test, the question. They have to fast before this test and then they give you this, a cup of this sticky sweet liquid to drink and then you wait a couple of hours and then you come back and they draw blood. You're not supposed to smoke or be active during that period of time. The range uh, greater than 200 indicates diabetes. This is just a chart, chart that kind of shows you if your hemoglobin A1C is 6.0, then your average blood glucose has been about 120 over that, that, that two to three month period. Uh, I'm not going to ask you this on a test, so don't try to memorize it, but it just uh, kind of gives you some idea. Um, Look at the uh, 7.0. If it's 7, then your glucose is, uh, your uh, fasting blood glucose has been a, an average of about 150 over the last three months or so. Just gives you. Uh, your book does point out that the hemoglobin A1C levels are known to be higher in African Americans than in Caucasians. Some other diagnostic tests that they'll do is they'll look at ketones in the urine. Now, some of the things you need to tell your patient is that we don't normally test for ketones in the urine, but this is when we test for them. If the patient is acutely ill, we test for ketones in the urine. And if the blood glucose level is greater than 300, you need to tell your patient that they need to be testing for ketones in their urine if their fasting blood glucose is consistently greater than 300. During pregnancy, they need to t test for ketones. And when they have symptoms of ketoacidosis, and we haven't talked about that yet, but we're going to talk about that before the day's over. Also, they'll be doing kidney function tests. When they go in, uh, most of your, di your diabetics, uh, at least your type 2 diabetics, go in to be checked twice a year and they always do kidney function tests and they are looking for albumin in the urine because albumin in the urine is the first sign that there may be something going on with the kidneys. That there may be some kidney damage going on. I don't have it up here but we they also will do a creatinine clearance and that ev will evaluate the glomerular filtration rate. And they do that if the urine is positive for protein. So it's real important. They need to have their kidney function test each year. They need to see an eye doctor each year. Those are some things they need to do. Now here's the hallmark of treating for diabetes. Exercise, medication, and diet. And in the middle of that is glucose monitoring along with their medications. So exercise, medication, and diet. Is, that's what you do to treat diabetes. It's like a triangle. So the first thing we need to talk about is they need to maintain their blood glucose levels. So they need to tightly control their blood glucose levels. So they need to be monitoring it because that helps decrease the risk of complications. Uh, and we talked about a little bit about those the other day. We talked about the, the problems with amputation. We talked about the problems with the eyes. We talked about the problems with kidneys. Uh, we talked about a lot of things as far as complications. Uh, so if they keep their blood glucose level under control, then it decreases the risk of them having 
complications later. Uh, so again, medication, diet, and exercise. So we're going to talk about those three things. So insulin for your type 1 diabetics. We use insulin. When we say it's exogenous insulin, it's outside the body. It's, it's humanly made insulin. Endogenous, endogenous insulin is what we make if we have a, a healthy pancreas. So exogenous insulin, we use it with type 1 diabetics. They have to have it to live. We use it with type 2 diabetics if they're unable to control their blood glucose levels with oral, oral anti-diabetics and or diet and exercise. We use exogenous insulin in both type 1 and type 2 during times of physical stress. If you have a diabetic, a type 2 diabetic that goes to the hospital and maybe has surgery um, and they're not taking insulin at home, I can guarantee you they're going to be on insulin while they're in the hospital more than likely, because hospitalization is a stressor, and a stressor makes your blood glucose level go up. Um, we've already talked about oral corticosteroids, your prednisone. Uh, if they have diabetic ketoacidosis, they're going to get insulin for that. That's part of the treatment. Hyperosmo or hyperglycemic state, you see that in your type 2 diabetics, and we're going to see, we're going to talk about that before we leave this morning. That's a life-threatening complication that your type 2 diabetics can go into, and they will be treated with insulin, exogenous insulin. So we'll talk about that before we leave this morning. And with your high caloric tube feedings, your parental nutrition, we've already talked about. You have to remember that in a normal person who has a normal pancreas, their pancreas is secreting a small amount of insulin continuously. And then when they eat, the pancreas will secrete more insulin to take care of the food that they've eaten. But that's not going on in a patient that has type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So they need exogenous insulin. Okay, well, apparently I have one that y'all don't have, so let me just tell you what I've got on this one. Um, <coughs> for a patient that's on insulin, the, the dosage is carefully planned based on their lifestyle because not all diabetics have the same insulin regimen as another diabetic, so it's carefully planned on their lifestyle and on their meal planning. Um, and if they don't eat enough after they take insulin, then they're going to have hypoglycemia. And heavy exercise can also cause hypoglycemia. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when, you, when we start talking about exercise. And if they're going to exercise, they should uh, eat before they exercise. When I talk about, when I say that, use the term basal amount of insulin, the pancreas constantly is secreting a small amount of insulin, and that's called basal insulin. And so the treatment for diabetes when we give a patient insulin, we're trying to mimic what the pancreas would do normally. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to replicate what the pancreas would normally do. Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about insulin, and let's talk about the different types of insulin. I've, as I've already said, insulin is necessary for your type 1 diabetic. You've got, they've got to have it to live, but it also may, may be necessary for your type 2 diabetic. A lot of times type 2 diabe diabetics will start out with oral, oral anti-diabetic agents, and over time those oral anti-diabetic agents will no longer keep their blood glucose level under control, and so the doctor will have to start them on insulin. So, and, and that doesn't make them a type 1 diabetic. They're still a type 2 diabetic. So let's talk about the different types of insulin. You have your rapid-acting insulin. 
your short acting insulin, your intermediate, your long acting, and also we have mixed insulin. And by the way, insulin, the insulin that you'll be using in the clinical area will be 100 units per milliliter. 100 units per milliliter. There is an insulin that's 500 units per milliliter, but you see those in your critical care areas. <coughs> And I hope by now, because y'all have had medication checkoffs and you've had insulin, you've had to do sub Qs, you know that when you look at your 100 unit insulin bottle, that you should have a 100 unit syringe. You, it, it should one cc in that of that syringe would be 100 units, 100 units per cc. Um, so let's talk about your wrapping at rapid acting insulins. Um, and I got this straight from your book. Um, the two that you're going to see most often in the clinical area, you're, actually your book mentions three, and I'll mention the third one, but, but I'm going to focus more on the two, Novolog and Humalog. Novolog is insulin aspart, A-S-P-A-R-T. That's Novolog. And Humalog is insulin Lispro, L-I-S-P-R-O. Both of them are rapid acting. Um, Novolog... The onset's 15 minutes, it peaks in one to three hours, and the duration is three to five hours. What was the peak? The peak is one to three hours, and the duration is three to five hours, and you need to give this right before the meal. In the clinical area, I will not let my students give insulin until the trays are on the floor. Once the trays are on the floor, then we prepare the insulin because by the time we get it prepared and give it to them, then it's about time that they're bringing the tray into the room because you, because this is rapid acting, you don't want to give it and the trays not come for 30 or 40 minutes because they're going to go into a hypoglycemic reaction if you do. So the onset is five to ten. Is, is the onset is 15 minutes. The Humalog, the onset is 5 to 15 minutes. I kind of think 15 minutes for both of them, about 15 minutes. Th this one peaks more quickly, though, in a half to one hour, and the duration is 3 to 4. Both of these medicines you can mix with MPH. MPH is cloudy. Your rapid-acting insulins are clear. Y'all know that, I, I know for sure. The last one is a Preta, uh, and it's also a rapid acting insulin, and it can be mixed with MPH. And the onset is just about the same as the, as the others. Onset's 15 to 30, peaks in an hour, duration three to four. So you can see for all three of these, they last about three to five hours. And the onset's very close to 15 minutes for all of them. Did I see a hand? Yeah. For Do you uh, do you have the newer book? Okay, because I was looking at the older book. It says what? Five hours. Five hours for Humalog. Okay. Well, it's still in the ballpark. What I tell the what I tell students is that when you look at different references, they might not have exactly the same thing when they give you a range of something, but if it's within the ballpark, so three to four hours, three to five hours, it's very close. You're not gonna ask a specific question. I'm, I'm not asking that specifically on a test. There is one question on the test about peaking, and, and uh, so I will tell you, well, make sure you know when the intermediate insulins peak and what the duration of them are. Um, I lost my train of thought because I was going to tell you something else and I forgot what it was now. Sorry. That's okay. It'll come back to me. It'll come back to me. Oh, I know what I was going to say. In the clinical area, you better know these because your instructor's going to ask you. Right, but I just meant like mm -hmm. an out, like yeah. short acting. Yeah, like they're gonna, range. yeah, they're going to ask you. Now, let's move to the next slide because it has the, the regular insulin. Up. Yeah, yeah. That one's got Humalog, and also I want to talk about regular now. Regular insulin is a short-acting insulin, and we see it given a lot too. It is also clear it is the only insulin that can be given IV, the only insulin that can be given IV. And so this is the insulin that we use to treat uh, 
di uh, diabetic ketoacidosis because we have to give uh, IV insulin for diabetic ketoacidosis. The onset's 30 to 60, the peak's in 2 to 4, and the duration is 3 to 4. 2 to 4. Onset's 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Peak is 2 to 4, and the duration is 3 to 4 hours. Now your MPH is an intermediate acting insulin. And we see that given a lot in the clinical area. Um, for this one, if I had to give someone NPH in the morning, so a lot of patients will get a, a, either a daily dose of NPH or maybe NPH maybe in the morning and then in the evening. And that will cover their insulin needs for the day. As I said, it's very individualized based on what the patient and the doctor have figured out that the patient needs. But if I had to give that to a patient and the trays weren't on the floor, I wouldn't be so worried about giving them that one because it doesn't peak for one to two hours. So if it was about time for the trays to come and I had, I, I had to give that, I would go ahead and give it. This one is cloudy. So you take it and you roll it in your hands like this to mix it. Don't shake it. You never shake insulin. You roll it in your hands. And you can mix this with an Ovalog and Humalog or regular insulin. Your insulin glar glargine, that is Lantus insulin. Have any of you given Lantus insulin in the clinical area? This is a long-acting insulin, 24 hours. You do not mix this with anything. Do not mix it with anything. As I said, it lasts over 24 hours. It has no peak time. And then, I don't know if I put a slide for Levamir or not. No, I didn't. The other one that I want to talk about, there's no slide up there for it, is Levamir. It's also a long-acting insulin. And this one lasts 24 hours. Actually, the onset is over 24 hours. And this one does have a peak. It peaks in about six to eight hours. And you don't mix this one with anything else either. These two, Lantus and Levamir, you don't mix with anything. And there up there you can see uh, I've got the 100 units of insulin, that's U100, and the 500 units of milliliter, that's U500. And of course, as I said, the 500, uh, we're not going to be given because we're not going to be in a critical care area. That's in, uh, where your patients are very, very ill and they use uh, U500. The other one that's not up there is there's mixed insulins. And I'm just going to give you an example, a couple of examples. There's lots of different mixed insulins, as your book points out, like Humulin 7030 or Novolin 7030. That just means that 70% of it is NPH and 30% of it is regular. So if you have a, um, if you have to give a patient a 70-30 or a 75-25 or whatever it is, then you need to look it up and find out what the mixture is because your instructor for sure is going to ask you what it is. But it means that one of them, the, the larger proportion of it is an intermediate acting insulin and the smaller proportion of it is either a uh, fast acting insulin or a regular insulin. Okay, we've kind of alluded to this. Um, as I said earlier, the insulin 
regimen for patients is very individualized um, and I wanted to just kind of give you some examples of what the patient might be on. Uh, one patient may be on one injection of intermediate or long-acting insulin. That might do it for once for a patient. Say a daily dose of NPH and that might be it or a daily dose of Levomir or Lantus and that might do it. Or they may be on one injection of a combination of a short and intermediate acting insulin like regular and NPH. Regular is your short acting insulin. Or they may be on uh, multiple component insulin which means that it could be a combination of a short and an intermediate acting insulin twice daily say two-thirds before breakfast and one-third before evening meal those are just some examples of what a patient might be on and again it's very individualized it depends on what that patient's needs are and um, what the doctor and the patient with trial and error have figured out that this patient needs Some more intensified regimens are a basal dose of intermediate or long-acting insulin and a bolus of short or rapid-acting insulin. Uh, and the blood glucose level determines the dosage of a short or rapid-acting insulin sliding scale. Um, that would be another type of regimen that a patient might be on. So again, don't try to memorize these. I'm just trying to give you some examples of what the patient might be on based on that patient's individualized needs. Okay. Insulin, as I mentioned before, is also used for type 2 diabetics and some of this is going to be uh, a repeat of what I've already said when they can't be managed with their oral medication uh, and also when they're hospitalized. Uh, in ICU, uh, type 2 diabetics that are in ICU, what they found out is that they do better if they're if they have intensive insulin therapy while they're in ICU if they're a type 2 diabetic. Type 2 diabetics it, when they're post-operative they found out that if they have insulin therapy that they have decreased risk of post-operative infection and remember we said that with the diabetic the risk of infection is high. IV insulin infusions maintain normal blood Blood, blood glucose and they need frequent monitoring. So if they have an insulin infusion, if they're in the hospital and they have an insulin infusion, you've got to monitor them closely. That's the bottom line. Okay. I hope by now everybody knows that you have to rotate sites when you uh, uh, have a patient that's uh, diabetic and they're receiving insulin. Where do you think most of the patients that uh, give themselves their insulin at home, give them their, where do they give it, give it to abdomen. themselves? They give it to themselves in their abdomen. And so when they come in, when you look at their abdomen, you have to look to see if they've got areas where you can give the insulin because over when they give injections in the same area over and over, they will get what we call uh, lip, lipodystrophy and the, uh, the area will become lumpy and it will become atrophy. And then when they come in the hospital and we look at those areas and we decide we don't want to give them there because they're all lumpy and they look atrophied and we start giving in their arm, what do you think happens? They get better absorption because they don't get as good absorption here because they've used the same area over and over and over. So we have to rotate sides. Um, this book might say it, but other, I, I, didn't, I, I don't remember seeing it in this book, but other books say you need to... There's a picture in your book that shows you the sites that you can give insulin. And you're supposed to give it in all the sites in that one area and then rotate to another site. So if you're giving them in the arm, then you could rotate down to the uh, one side of the abdomen. You could go actually down to the thighs, go to the other side, go up to the abdomen and come back to the arm and then go over to the other arm. Now actually it shows in the book that you can give it in, in, the, in the back of around the shoulder area, but I don't know anybody that's an acrobat and can get back there with a needle and give themselves an injection. If they had somebody else giving it to them, maybe that would work. But 
they say if you use all the areas in one, all the sites in one area, and then go to the next area, and then the next area, and then the next area, then by the time you get back to the area that you started with, all of that will be healed. And then you can start again in that area. And you should give them your injections about one and a half inches apart, one to one and a half inches apart. <clears throat> and that helps prevent the lipodystrophy and the lipoatrophy. I know by now y'all know don't massage after you give an injection. But you can lightly apply pressure. We should have learned that in 111. And here's your sites. Back here, you can give it back here. <coughs> okay, let's talk about insulin pumps for a minute. Um, a lot of people now are using insulin pumps and I think younger people are using insulin pumps. This is an external machine that has a tubing and then a needle on the end and they inject the needle subcutaneously into their abdomen and they wear the pump. The pump has a reservoir in it and they fill it with uh, rapid acting insulin. Uh, and it's programmed to give them a continuous small amount of rapid acting insulin throughout the day. And this acts more like the pancreas. They can also program it to give them a bolus of insulin based on how many carbohydrates they eat at each meal. And so this is really good to help them control their blood glucose level. So a lot of your, um, I think especially younger diabetics are using this. And that gives you an example. Okay, now this for the test. <coughs> How do we mix insulin? Does everybody remember from 111? Clear to file insulin. Mm -hmm. Clear to file insulin. Which one do you put air in first? MPA. Did I hear somebody say cloudy? Mm -hmm. You put the air in the cloudy, you put the air in the clear, you draw up the clear, and then you draw up the cloudy. Put air in the cloudy, put air in the clear, draw up the clear, and then draw up the cloudy. You put the air in the cloudy, I mean to put air in the clear, and then you put your air in let me start again. You put air in the cloudy, you put your air in the clear, and you don't take your needle out, then you draw up your clear. And then you take your needle out, and you put your needle in the cloudy, and you pull back till you get to the correct dose. Don't push back into the clear. I mean, yeah, don't push back, because you'll mix, you'll mix the two insulins if you push back. So put air in your clear. Oh Lord. Put air in your cloudy, put air in your clear, draw up your clear, and then draw up your cloudy. I'm, make sure you know that for the test. Alright, I have something for you all. I decided that I would share a part of my notes with you all. my notes on oral anti-diabetic agents. So we're going to go over them after everybody gets theirs.
But I want tonight, but I'm so glad I got tomorrow off. It's hard to keep up. I don't think y'all have this in your, um, I don't see it in that, that uh, slideshow, so I don't think y'all have what I'm giving you, so uh, when everybody gets one, we'll talk about them. Okay, has everyone got one now? Okay, these are the medications, and I don't think I have a slide for it, so I think I added this after I put this on Blackboard. The medications that are used for type 2 diabetics, there's, there's uh, several categories, so we're going to talk about them. First are your sulfonylureas. The second one are you, your big UNIs. Uh, the third one uh, is your alpha glucosidase inhibitors. And the, thir the next one is, I cannot pronounce that word, it starts with a T, thiozolidion, something. The next one is megalonitinides, and then incretin enhancers, and then we're also going to talk about amylin analogs and also combination agents. So let's look at these. Let's first talk about, about your sulfonylureas, and the one we're going to talk about the most is glucotrol, but we also, well actually we're going to talk about both of them because I've given you stuff that's that's uh, true to the medicines within this cat within this uh, category. So uh, with your sulfonylureas, it's glucotrol and amaryl, and I think glucotrol is probably given more often. But look at what uh, first of all, look at what these how these act. They stimulate release of insulin from the pancreas, and they increase sensitivity of of the insulin receptors and that's one of the those are the two things that we said is going wrong with type 2 diabetics either they're not <coughs> making enough insulin or their receptor cell receptors are not sensitive to the insulin or both they may have both things going on so these two drugs will increase the sensitivity and also uh, stimulate the increase of insulin from the pancreas the thing you need to remember from with this is that uh, it can cause liver toxicity these, these drugs can cause liver toxicity, and so they should not be drinking alcohol when they take these drugs. So if you've got a patient that has an alcohol problem, the doctor shouldn't order these, either one of these drugs for that patient. Of the big UNIs, glucophage is the one that we're going to talk about, and that is ordered a lot in the hospital too, and, and patients take it a lot at home. This one also will increase insulin resistance. Uh, will increase, increase insulin sensitivity and also increase the, the uh, production of insulin from the pancreas. Uh, you don't want to use this one in patients that have impaired kidney function. So the doctors have to think about these things when they, they prescribe these medications. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you've got it on your paper. Incre they decrease insulin sensitivity. They decrease insulin resistance and increase insulin sensitivity. And they decrease glucose production by the liver. Your alpha gluconocides inhibitors, precose and glycet, these act a little differently. Look at what they do. They delay absorption of carbohydrates from the small intestine. So if they delay absorption of carbohydrates from the small intestine, then it's going to impact the blood glucose level. But they have GI side, side effects with this drug, these two drugs. You have to monitor liver function with this, these two drugs also. The next category or group, the thyroid drugs, 
Actos and Avandia. We've heard a lot about these on the news because these can cause heart problems. These two drugs can cause heart problems. They improve insulin sensitivity, and because they improve insulin sensitivity, more glucose will get into the cells. Again, you have to monitor liver function, and they can cause heart failure. So you need to monitor your patient for these things. If you have a patient that has heart failure, they're contraindicated. Your megalotinides, Prandon and Starless. There's no reason why one is bolded and the other one isn't. It just, when I printed it, that was the way it was. I don't know what happened. Both will stimulate release of insulin from the pancreas, but they can cause hypoglycemia and again, liver failure. Use cautiously in patients with liver failure. Now, your incretin enhancers. Incretins are normal gut hormones that will help keep the glucose under control. And so these drugs mimic these incretin enhancers. And so they can cause hypoglycemia if they're taken with a sulfonylurea. They lower glucagon secretion from the pancreas, and as a result, they have less glucose production. Remember, that's what happens uh, when you don't eat. Your liver will uh, change uh, the stored uh, glucose back into glucose and it'll go into the bloodstream. Bieta. Bieta is one of these drugs and it's given subcutaneously. It stimulates the release of insulin and it can cause hypoglycemia if given with a sulfonylurea. Contraindicated in renal disease. Victoza is another one. We hear about these two drugs on the on TV. They're advertised all the time. This one's given sub-Q also. It, it enhances glucose release. With this one, you have to monitor the patient for pancreatitis. And then we have the D, DDP4 inhibitors. These inhibit the enzymes that inactivate in cretins. And so they will uh, decrease the blood glucose. Genuvia is one. These are used with type 2 diabetics. And you have to monitor kidney function and symptoms of pancreatitis. Anytime it says monitor for pancreatitis, you have to monitor these patients for severe abdominal pain. Yes, ma'am. Are, are all these with type 2 diabetes? Yes, these are type 2 okay. diabetic drugs. So are you just pointing that out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Simulin, your book mentioned Simulin, so I thought we'd talk about that one. This one is an Amblin analog, and it's given sub-Q before meals. It slows gastric emptying, so it will lower the blood glucose level. You don't mix this with insulin. If the patient's on this and on insulin, you inject them in different sites. This one is, can be used for type 1 and type 2 diabetics. and it can cause hypoglycemia. There also are some combination uh, agents, uh, oral anti-diabetic agents. Sometimes if a patient's been on an oral anti-diabetic agent for a while and it no longer seems to be effective, what they can do is they can, take the, the, they can put the patient on a combination agent of two different oral anti-diabetic agents that have been combined into one pill, and those seem to work well. And I didn't give you an example of that because there's quite a few different ones and I didn't want you to try to memorize those. Maybe I did. Glucophage is an example on the, on the next page. Glucavance is, is a combination of glyburide and metformin. I think that's a pretty common one that's used. We're going to take a break in a minute. Okay. Okay. The other thing I want to say as far as therapy for your diabetics is your doctors will put them on a daily dose of aspirin. 81 milligrams to 325 milligrams of enteric coated aspirin. And that's because they develop atherosclerosis faster than someone who does not have diabetes. 
And so that decreases the risk of them forming a clot, having an MI, having a stroke, having a pulmonary embolus. What's the other drug that I said that they put patients on to protect the kidney? What did I say? ACE inhibitors. <coughs> Okay, so we've talked about your medication. That's, that's one third of the approach. Let's talk about nutrition. Um, these are ADA guidelines for patients who are diabetics. We want them to, their nutrition to provide these things to help them maintain a normal glucose level. We want their serum lipid levels to be within normal limits also. We want their blood pressure to be within normal limits, but they need to have adequate calories. And that goes for not only just an ordinary adult, but also for a female who's pregnant, who's a diabetic, and for a child that has diabetes that's growing. They have to have adequate calories. We want to prevent or slow the complications. And also we need to think about culture when we're thinking about their diet. What are their cultural needs in, in relation to nutrition? We want them to still have pleasure when they're eating. And as I said, nutritional needs throughout the life cycle, whether they're a young adult, whether they're a child, whether they're a female that's expecting a baby, or whether they're an elderly person. And we also want to provide self-management training for managing diabetes. There needs to be a balance between nutrition, expenditure of energy, and the dose and the timing of their medications. Y'all wanna go ahead and take a break now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a 20 minute break. Come back about, uh, about 12 minutes till, and we'll continue. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. <laughs> I need us all the way on top of our game. I'm pumped to go to Christmas. Yeah. Oh, what is it? Yeah. Is there open that early in the morning? The hot wow. side will be yeah. on. <laughs> it is right there. It is. Y'all are filling it. Where is Christmas? I don't know, but I'll find it. It's right there on the Inner Street, near the hospital. Um, did y'all know that there is a Starbucks right next to the Northeast? Yeah, and there's one in there. <laughs> there's one right. inside Northeast? Right. Yeah. Get out of here. And they said they have Where's chocolate molten. Where they <laughs> Two was the lava right from the elevator. The one in the cafeteria. Uh, is it open right in the cafeteria? Like, it's in the front entrance, you know, where the water comes out? Only my best is Friday. Is yeah. that one in? Yeah. They need to work on it. Keep walking it to your right. In front of those elevators? No, like right beside the cafeteria. But the cafeteria does sell Starbucks. Across from like the radiology. Yeah, in front of the cafeteria. About diabetes. Uh, now we're going to talk about nutrition <clears throat> and carbohydrate intake for the diabetic is really important because that's what they're counting and it's very individualized based on their height, their weight, uh, but about 45 to 65 percent of the daily diet should be made up of carbohydrates and they can come from plant foods, milk and dairy products like fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes. They need at least 130 carbs a day, grams of carbohydrates a day. Look at the amount of protein intake. As Americans, we take in much more protein than this, but we should, our diet should be made up of about 15 to 20 percent. The total, total caloric count, about 15 to 20 percent of it should be protein. Um, and the protein we take in should be low fat and low cholesterol. And this helps prevent renal complications. You know, pro too much protein is hard on your kidneys. Okay. As far as dietary fat, less than 10% of the total kilocalories should be fat. We should have less than 300 milligrams of cholesterol a, diet, a, a day. 
and we should be reading labels because we need to decrease and diabetics and everyone should be decreasing the amount of saturated fats. Uh, you should minimize the amount of trans fats that you take in because trans fats will raise your LDL and your LDL is your bad cholesterol and it will lower your HDL which is your good cholesterol. The trans fats, do you know where they're found? They're found in uh, margarine and hydrogenated oils. You should, the, the diabetic and anyone should have two or more servings of fish a week because it has polyunsaturated fats in it. Two or more. And the American Heart Association says that your monosaturated fats are beneficial to the heart. And you found those you find those in olive oil, peanut oil, canola oil, safflower oil, and also sesame oil. And your diabetic should have an annual lipid profile to look at the triglycerides the cholesterol, your HDL, and your LDL. As far as dietary fiber, we all know that it's good for preventing constipation. You should have about 14 grams of, uh, per 1,000 calories. What? Per 1,000 1, calories. <laughs> And of course, your fi dietary fibers are found in things like legumes, fiber rich cereals, fruits and vegetables, whole grains. And fiber helps decrease your cholesterol. Did you know that? And when you're taking in a lot of fiber, you need to increase your fluid intake. As far as sodium, it should not exceed 3,000 3, milligrams a day. I think your book says about 2,300 milligrams. It's about a teaspoon. And did you know that you should restrict refined sugars? Now they're saying that sugar is, worse, is, is more detrimental to the heart than fat is. You should teach your diabetics that nutritive, nutritive sweeteners like sweet and low and all those things should be used with caution. In other words, they should use them just a few a day, not very many. And alcohol consumption should be limited also. And so the meal planning is individualized, and we're going to look at this next slide, and it's going to tell you some approaches to meal planning. One approach is the exchange system, and it's based on the food groups, and they can pick a certain number of foods from each food group. Their dietitian will help them work that out. But I think most of your diabetics use carbohydrate counting. That's what I do. Uh, the diet the dietitian that I worked with set up a diet for me and I can have so many carbs a day and I can have so many at breakfast I can have an in-between between meal snack between lunch and dinner and then a bedtime snack and each one of them has carbs in them so I know how many carbs I can have for each each one and if you stay within that you should be able to keep your blood sugar under control This uh, carbohydrate counting works well with patients that are on insulin pumps also because it helps them determine their coverage because, say, they have their insulin pump going and it's, it's pumping out a certain amount of bolus insulin continuously and then when they have breakfast they count their carbs and they give, them, they give themselves a bolus dose of insulin based on the carbs in breakfast, also based on the carbs in lunch when they have lunch, based on the carbs in, in dinner or supper, whatever you want to call it. And then if they have between meal snacks, also they can give themselves a bowl of stoves. And so it helps them keep their blood glucose level under control. And it's based on carbohydrate counting. Most of them will determine, let me, let me go up here and 
write this on the board because you will see this on the page. Most of them, the way they determine how much insulin to give themselves is they know that they can give, they are supposed to give themselves so many units of insulin based on how many grams of carbs they're eating. And so let's say the patient is on a 1 to 15 ratio and this is 18 and, and this is a carb, how many carbs they have. So one unit of insulin to 15 grams of carbs. So at lunch, if they had 60 carbs, how many units of insulin would they give themselves? Four. Four, because all they do is divide the 15 into the 60, right? If they did, if they had 120 carbs, uh, if they had 120 grams of carbs. If you may be right about 15 into 120, and it come up to eight units of insulin. So that's the way they do it. Uh, the doctor and the patient will determine how many units of insulin they need based on how many carbs they're taking in with each meal or each snack. So that's what we call carbohydrate counting. And that just gives you some examples of, of how many grams of carbs. Okay. And this is the insulin to carbohydrate ratio that I just talked about. Um, they use it in the injection in the uh, insulin pumps, rapid acting insulin. They they also count it when they're doing physical exercise. And your type two diabetics focus more on lifestyle, and if insulin is needed, then there should be consistency in timing and also car and the carbohydrate content of the meals. All right, exercise is the other component. So we've talked about medicine, we've talked about nutrition, and now we're talking about exercise. And some things you need to know about exercise. If you have a patient that's a diabetic, if they exercise, they're going to have better regulation of their blood glucose level. It just goes without saying. Exercise will lower the insulin requirements in a type 1 diabetic. If you've got a patient that is a type 1 diabetic and they're going to be exercising, say they decide they're going to run in a marathon, first of all, they have to get themselves cleared by their doctor, but if they're going to run by the, in a marathon and they have gotten it cleared by the doctor, then they need to eat before the before they run. They need to have a snack with them, and they need to eat after they run because that exercise is going to help the insulin get into the cells and it's going to cause them, it's going to lower their blood glucose level, <coughs> and they might go into hypoglycemia. So it's going to lower their blood glucose level. So they need to be checking their blood glucose level before during and after they, they run, they need to be eating before, they need to have a snack, and then they need to eat afterwards. Exercise includes, increases insulin sensitivity, so it helps the insulin carry the glucose into the cells. It also decreases cardiovascular risk, it improves cardiac function, decreases blood pressure, helps you lose weight. It helps uh, with blood lipid levels makes those high density lipoproteins go up. If you exercise, you're gonna have better high density lipoprotein levels. And it will also help prevent or control or delay the onset of type two diabetes. Now, this is what I just said a minute ago. Exercise in a person with di diabetes mellitus can cause hypoglycemia because it helps the glucose get into the cells and it inhibits the release of glucose from the liver. So they're going to have hypoglycemia if they don't plan ahead. They should not exercise in extreme cold or hot weather. They should exercise in relation to meals and injections. They should eat a snack before, during, and after exercise and carry simple sugar with them. Simple sugar like Lifesavers, 
a candy bar. Now, those are not the kinds of things that we would normally tell a diabetic to eat or to consume. But if they are hypoglycemic, we want something that's going to get into the bloodstream quickly. So, lifesavers would work really well. And it's not one lifesaver. I think your book says six or eight. I can't remember exactly what it says, but it's, it's a number of lifesavers. They should not exercise during their peak time of their insulin. So if they're going to exercise and if they've taken insulin like they've taken MPH, they should think about when their insulin is going to peak because that's not when they should be exercising because their blood glucose level is going to be at its slowest then. Hard candy, lifesavers, any kind of hard candy. For your type 2 diabetic, exercise may also decrease the need for your oral anti-glycemic agents, uh, anti-diabetic agents. So uh, if you have a type 2 diabetic that's going to exercise, these rules also apply and they should think about their anti-diabetic uh, medication. So look at this. I was looking at this last night when I was reviewing my notes. Exercise guide for diabetic thickness. Uh, you, they need to exercise three to four times a week. And the intensity 60 to 80 percent of the maximal heart rate. And aerobic activity 20 to 30 minutes with five to 10 minutes warm up. Oh, another thing is if they have ketones in their urine, they should not exercise also. Because if they have ketones in their urine, that indicates that there's not enough insulin available to take care of uh, their, their insulin needs and that they're making ketone bodies, they're breaking down fats and proteins, so exercise will just make it worse. Now, how does a diabetic that's on insulin manage sick day? Now, sometimes we think that they shouldn't have their insulin, but that's not true. They should take their insulin. They should take their anti-diabetic agents. Because if they don't take them, then no glucose is getting into the cells for energy. And if they're sick or if they're having surgery, their glucose levels are going to increase anyway because it's a stressor. So if they're sick, they should monitor their blood glucose level at least four times a day. They should test their urine for ketones if their blood glucose level, this one says greater than 240, the other one says greater than, uh, uh, it says uh, greater than 300. So we're going to go 240 to 300 if you see anything like that on the test. They should continue their normal insulin and hypoglycemic dose and they should sip water each hour and use easily digested liquids and they should call their health care provider. So if you've got a patient that's sick, they should continue with their insulin and their hypoglycemic agent. Okay, one of the things we do is we teach our new diabetics to monitor their own glucose level. And you know we have all of the little machines that are out now, uh, the glucose monitoring machines. There's uh, all different kinds, but they all work basically the same. The reason we teach them to monitor their blood glucose level is because it helps them maintain their blood glucose level within normal limits. They, can, they know what their blood glucose level is. We don't use urine testing anymore. We used to do that all the time. We used to test the urine for, for sugar, but we don't do that anymore because it's not as reliable as what we have out now. Um, but teaching your diabetic to monitor their blood glucose level helps them decrease the danger of going into a hypoglycemic attack. Your type 1 diabetics usually monitor their blood glucose level three to four times a day. Um, and for your type one, uh, type two diabetics, if they're stable, they usually monitor their blood glucose level probably about once a day.
So what they need is they need a lancet. Of course, they, they need the little glucose monitor. They need a lancet, and then they need the impregnated test strips. And you have to get the test strips that fit the machine that you have. It, they're, you know, you get the wrong test strips, they won't work. And you have to look at the dates because they will become outdated. Look at the date on the box. Clients who, who have a higher heat, uh, hematocrit sometimes have a falsely low blood glucose reading. And some medication can, medications can cause an inaccurate result. And as I said, see the bottom line, be sure your test strips are compatible with your meter. And these are some drugs that can affect the, the fasting blood glucose level. Uh, look over there under increases of blood glucose level. We've already mentioned several of those. ETOH, everybody knows that means alcohol. Alcohol can increase your blood, uh, your blood glucose level because it's got a lot of sugar in it. Uh, you see down there corticosteroids. We talked about the prednisone, didn't we? We talked about the dilantin. Phenobarb and dilantin can cause the blood glucose level to go up, and, and we have a lot of patients that are on seizures, that have seizures that are on those two medicines. <coughs> uh, look up there, did you see Lasix? Lasix can make the blood glucose level go up. Calcium channel blockers. So there's a lot of things that can make the blood glucose level go up, but look over on the other side, some of the things that can lower your blood glucose level. Tylenol, beta blockers. Aspirin in large doses. So there's medicines can affect the blood glucose level. So what I'm saying to you is you need to be reading the side effects of your medications to, especially if you have a diabetic, look at their medications and see if there's anything that they're on that can increase the blood glucose level or decrease the blood glucose level for that matter. Some approaches to treating diabetes, uh, they can do surgery, they can do a pancreas transplantation, but as with all kinds of transplantation, whether it's heart, lung, whatever, pancreas, they have to go on the anti-rejection drugs for the rest of their life, and those have side effects. They can cause cancer, they can increase the risk of infection. So you don't hear a lot about anybody that's had a pancreas transplant. I think one time in my career I've, I've taken care of a patient that had a pancreas transplant. And the patient had had it at a large teaching hospital and was in the hospital where I was working for something else, but had had a pancreas transplant. The other one, the islet cell transplantation, is that's where they inject mm. uh, islet cells uh, into the portal vein and they lodge in the liver. This is... This is um, still experimental, so we're just mentioning it. I think we've said, I've said this probably three or four times a day, stress, the stress of surgery will elevate the blood glucose level, but surgery also increases the risk that I've got listed there. Metabolic acidosis, which is ketoacidosis, it increases the risk of your diabetic having hypertension or ischemic heart disease, a stroke, or MI, because they've got atherosclerosis. It increases the risk of acute kidney injury, and we're already concerned about their kidneys. It increases the risk of infection and delayed wound healing, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, and also hypoglycemia. So you can see if you have a diabetic that goes into surgery, what kind of issues you might have to deal with with this patient and what you have to monitor them for. The list goes on and on. <coughs> so if you have a patient that's a diabetic and they're going into surgery, of course we're going to do preoperative care. Have y'all had surgery yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with preoperative care, that's the part where you're getting the patient ready for surgery and you're going to be doing a lot of teaching during that period of time. They're going to have all these tests that they're going to have done in preparation for surgery. Intraoperative care is within the surgical unit while they're having the surgical procedure done. And so most of these patients are going to go to surgery with an insulin drip.
because they're a diabetic and the dose is very individualized. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you that dosage on the test. I just gave it to you because it's in the book. And then post-operative care, you're going to do all those things that we talked about just a minute ago. You're going to monitor them for, uh, you're, of course you're going to monitor their blood glucose level and you're going to monitor them for infection, wound healing. Uh, you're going to monitor their fluid and electrolyte balance, their kidney function. Monitor their uh, AVGs because they're at risk for metabolic acidosis. Uh, all those things, hypertension. So those are the things you're going to be looking at. Sometimes they continue with the insulin IV postoperatively, but it's for short term. And what insulin did I say was given IV? Regular. 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 That's the only one. Okay. So let's talk about foot care because it's really important for your diabetic, whether it's a type 1 or type, or, or type 2 diabetic. They're at risk for diabetic foot problems and they're at risk for developing, gang, developing a wound on their lower extremities, developing gangrene and having a amputation. You can also see their circulation problems. They can have deformities. I think your put, book shows a picture of the foot that it's kind of turned to the side. Uh, loss of strength and loss of sensation. Uh, foot injuries are the most common complication of, di of, of diabetics that leads them to having to go to the hospital. Uh, and of course it can lead to a foot ulcer and, and amputation as I said. Uh, remember we talked about the peripheral neuropathy, the nerves in the lower extremities and sometimes in the hands and the fingers. Uh, are, di are damaged and so they no, no longer have uh, sensation in those areas. And poor circulation also, all those increase the risk of them developing an, an ulcer. One of the things that they need to do is keep that blood glucose level under control. If you have a patient that you're assessing and when you assess their lower extremities and you know that they have loss of sensation, what are you going to do at that point? What do you want to be looking for? Right, right down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right down. Do they have any skin breakdown? Because they may have it and not know it because they can't feel it. This is what you need to teach them daily. This is really important. They need to wash their feet daily, not in hot water, but warm water and dry their feet thoroughly. They need to dry between their toes. They need to inspect their feet daily for breakdown. They need to get a mirror and look under the, at the bottom of their feet. If they, can't, if they can't get their foot up so they can see the bottom of their foot, and some of your older folks can, especially if they're large, they can't get their feet up so they can see the bottom of their feet, they can use a mirror. They need to wear clean socks every day and tell your ladies and also your men not to wear well, ladies not to wear tight garters and men not to wear socks that are tight on their legs so that they constrict their legs. I don't think we see as many women wearing garters as we used to, mm -hmm. but there used, used to be ladies wore those all the time. Teach them not to trim their toenails. They should be trimmed by podiatrists. They should not use a hot water bottle or a heating pad because they may not be able to feel it and they may be burned. They should wear comfortable shoes all the time that fit properly. Do not go barefooted and they should co contact their physician if they have any injury to the feet. And that means even something as simple as a blister. Because a blister can lead to further skin breakdown, gangrene, amputation. Of course, your, these foot conditions, the things that bring it on are the neuropathy, they don't feel it, and also the poor circulation, the poor perfusion to their lower extremities. Some of the medications that these patients may have because they have this decreased sensation, they may have the tingling and the burning and uh, the sensations in their lower extremities. Have any of you given gab gabapentin in the clinical area? Gabapentin, which is also known as neurotin, it's actually an anticonvulsant but it also is used for neuropathic pain. 
What do you think the biggest side effect of that is that you should monitor for? Shakes. Hmm? We have shakes and a lot. The thing that I'm thinking of is changes in behavior, suicidal tendencies. <clears throat> Lyrica is another one. Lyrica is also a neuropathic, it's for neuropathic pain. Uh, that is pregabalin. Pregabalin is the other name for Lyrica. Also, you need to monitor for, it's also an anticonvulsant, and you also need to monitor for suicidal tendencies or changes in behavior. I was on gabapentin, and I had like really bad dreams. Did you? Well, I was on Lyrica when I had shingles. It's, it's also used for shingles. It's used for neuropathic pain, and it's used for, oh, what's the other one? Uh, the one where they have pain all over, and it's hard for doctors to diagnose. Them fibromyalgia. It's fibromyalgia. Um, it's also used for that, and it was wonderful. But it's also a controlled substance, and so they don't like you to be on it for long. Um, so, but those, if they work, they really work well. If you if you send a patient that they work, they work really well. They they work. Lyrica worked wonderfully with me for my shingles pain. Um, Cymbalta is another one. Cymbalta is a serotonin nor uh, epinephrine reuptake inhibitor, and it's also used for neuropathic pain. Cymbalta. I'm going to say this one more time. I y'all probably, probably said it to y'all going to be sick of it, but your diabetic should have a regular eye examination every year and also should have their kidney function test uh, evaluated, their kidney function evaluated twice a year, and they're looking for albumin in their urine, and they're going to look at their creatinine, their creatinine clearance, and also their serum creatinine. Today. Okay, let's talk about hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is one of the, uh, if you want to call it a complication, you can call it a complication of diabetes. Uh, it's very common in type 1 diabetics, but you can also see it in type 2 diabetics. Uh, and the, re the cause is, can be several different causes. It can be because they've taken too much insulin. It can be because they've taken their insulin but they didn't eat. That's why when, when you give a patient their insulin in the morning, you should always note how much they eat on that breakfast tray. Because that's one of the things I'm going to ask you, and the other instructors are going to ask you that too. What did they eat? And they also can become hypoglycemic if they increase their exercise. There's something called hypoglycemic unawareness, and that's when... They, uh, they don't experience the symptoms of hypoglycemic, but they're actually uh, have, the, have the problem. They are becoming hypoglycemic, but they don't experience the symptoms. And you know the symptoms are things like nervousness, jitteriness, shakiness, mental confusion, headache, those kinds of things. We're going to talk about them more. This is also called insulin shock. Another name for it is insulin shock. And that's when the blood glucose level is less than 70. Although I've seen patients that with blood glucose levels less than 70 and they didn't have any symptoms. So that they probably were having hypoglycemic unawareness. Uh, so let's look at some of the symptoms. Tachycardia, the heart rate increases, irritability, restlessness, excessive hunger, Diaphoresis, so their skin is moist because they're, they're sweating, right? Depression, some things that are not up there, they may feel weak. They may be confused. Think about the brain not getting the glucose it needs, so you're feeling confused. Difficulty thinking, tremors. They can actually go into seizures. So if their blood glucose level is less than 50, we give them, we put them in the hospital. 
50 milligrams per deciliter because they can go into a coma and have seizures. And of course, their behavior might be altered because the brain's not being nourished with glucose. Now, this is the treatment. We give them 15 to 20 grams of glucose if the blood sugar is less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And repeat it every 15 minutes if the blood glucose level is still less than 70 or if the patient is having symptoms. And once they're stable, we check the blood glucose level every hour. Now, what they call this is they call this the 15 to 15 rule. You give them 15 grams of carbohydrates and you wait 15 minutes and check their blood glucose level again. And if they're still symptomatic or if their blood glucose level is less than 70, you give them 15 grams of carbohydrates again. And you do that until the blood glucose level is stable. That's the 15 to 15 rule. So what has, what has 15 grams of carbohydrates? Remember the lifesavers I said? Five lifesavers have 15 grams of carbohydrates. Five. A half a cup of orange juice with no sugar in it. Don't put sugar in your orange juice. Because we used to do that. But what we found out is that the only thing we're doing is we put sugar in it, we get their blood glucose level to come up, and then a couple hours later, they're hyperglycemic and we have to treat them. So just put just the, just the, the orange juice, no sugar in it. <coughs> uh, three large marshmallows, eight ounces of skim milk. So you got the things uh, the things that you could keep in your pocket would be the three also three glucose tablets and you can actually buy glucose tablets. So you could teach a diabetic to keep glucose tablets or lifesavers in their pocket or in their pocketbook or whatever so that if they become hypoglycemic, they'd have them readily on hand. So, I'm sorry, what, what did I say what? Eight ounces. Um, so what can you teach your diabetic to help them prevent a hypoglycemic attack? First of all, Teach them to take the correct dose of insulin. Tell them not to change insulin brands because they may react differently to a different insulin brand. Teach them to eat the right amount of food. So if you're taking your insulin, you need to eat. And they need to exercise in moderation. And of course, what I said before, monitor the glucose level before, during, and after exercise and make sure they snack, they, t they eat before, have a snack with them, and eat afterwards. Really what they need to do is increase their carbohydrate consumption before and after and have a carbohydrate snack. And remember, alcohol can lead to hypoglycemia. hypoglycemia. <coughs> And if they are hypoglycemic, they need to monitor their blood glucose level before meals and at bedtime. Okay, if we put them in the hospital, and if they're unable to swallow and they're hypoglycemic, we can give them 50% dextrose IV. We also can give them glucagon. That can be given sub-Q or IM. It also can be given IV. And once they're responsive, we can give them a snack and continue to monitor the blood glucose level. So once they're responsive and we've got the blood glucose level under control, we can give them a, a protein snack like uh, peanut butter crackers, uh, cereal and milk, a peanut butter sandwich, something that'll get them, get, them, get them across the long haul. And this is just a little comic that talks about glucagon when the sugar's gone, a first aid kit for severe hypoglycemia. <coughs> and I've already said that, so we're going to move on. So we're going to talk about the acute complications of diabetes. We're going to talk about diabetic ketoacidosis, which occurs mostly in your type 1 diabetics. We're going to talk about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, which occurs in your type 2 diabetics. 
and we're going to talk about the own ph phenomenon and we're going to talk about the somo gi phenomenon i don't know how to say that word that looks like it's japanese to me but let's talk about dawn phenomenon first uh, dawn phenomenon is something that occurs during sleep uh, it's believed that because the growth hormones increase during sleep that it causes the blood glucose level to, to elevate uh, and it occurs usually between 4 and 8 a.m. Uh, and glucagon increases the blood glucose level and there's not enough insulin available during the night because they're sleeping and so their blood glucose level is elevated and so when they wake up they have hyperglycemia. So this occurs in both type 1 and type 2 diabetics. The next one, the Somogi phenomenon, this is a combination of hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia during the night with a rebound morning rise in the blood glucose level. So they have hypoglycemia during the night, but by the time they wake up in the morning, they're hyperglycemic. The blood glucose level will drop during the night, and the body will release glucose, and it makes the blood glucose level go up. Uh, and this comes about because of poor management of their diabetes. So, let's talk about diabetic ketoacidosis. I think I have another slide for that. Yeah. This is uncontrolled hyperglycemia in your type 1 diabetic. It's because of a deficiency in, of, of insulin. Um, and it, as I said, it occurs most often in type 1 diabetics, and it's usually brought on by infection or emotional stress or sickness, or it can actually be brought on just because simply they're not taking their insulin. But what happens is they become severely dehydrated. It's uncontrolled hyperglycemia. They've got all this glucose floating around in their blood, so they have a hyperosmolar blood. So let's talk about it a little bit. Their blood glucose level is greater than 300 milligrams per deciliter because of a deficiency of insulin. They become hyperglycemic. Their blood is hyperosmolar, all that glucose floating around in their blood. And because of that, they have what we call an osmotic diuresis. Remember your fluid and electrolytes. Because their blood is a hyperosmolar, water is going to be pulled from the cells and the interstitial spaces into the intravascular space. And so they're going to have an osmolar diuresis. And so they're going to be doing what? Having mm -hmm. what? Voiding. Polyuria. They're going to be voiding. 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 And so when they do that, they're losing not only water, but they're also losing electrolytes. And so what happens, they're going to be, the body's going to be burning fats and proteins for energy, and, what, and the end product of that is, would be ketones. And ketones are acid, and so they're going into metabolic acidosis. Now, they're going to have those typical symptoms of diabetes, polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Remember, the cells are thirsty, so they're going to be thirsty. The cells aren't getting any glucose for energy, so they're, they're going to be hungry. So they're going to have polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. Now, they're also, because they're going into metabolic acid, uh, uh, acidosis, they're going to have two small respirations. That's the body's compensatory response, blowing off CO2. Y'all remember all this from fluid and electrolytes and acid base? So when they blow off the CO2, what are we going to smell on their breath? Acetone. Fruity. Their breath is going to be fruity. Smell fruity. They're also going to be tachycardic because, remember, they're dehydrated, so that's another <coughs> compensatory response. The heart's going to work harder trying to get um, all those tissues well perfused. So they become dehydrated, and they are now hypovolemic. They have electrolyte imbalances, especially potassium. 
So that's what we're talking about. So let's talk about how we're going to treat them. We're going to give them sodium chloride to replace fluids. Do we want to give them dextrose? Why do we not want to give them dextrose? I want, I want to give them dextrose. Why are we not going to do that? It's got sugar in it, doesn't it? And they're already hyperglycemic, aren't they? So we're going to give them sodium chloride. If they have hypertension or if they have an increased sodium level, we can give them 4 or 5 sodium chloride. If they're at, also, if they're at risk of developing <laughs> congestive heart failure, we can give them 0.45 sodium chloride. 0.45. If they have heart failure, if they have hypertension, or if they have an increased sodium level. Now, remember in metabolic acidosis, we have too many hydrogen floating around in the blood, don't we? So remember, Miss Ward talked about that potassium can move out of the cells and hydrogen will move into the cells trying to correct your metabolic acidosis. Okay. So, at that point, at one point in this metabolic acidosis, their potassium level is probably going to be high because potassium has moved out of the cells and hydrogen has moved into the cells. So we're going to give them insulin IV. We're going to give them re regular insulin IV for several reasons. The insulin will help the potassium move back into the cells for one reason. So we now have to monitor for decreased potassium level. We have to make sure that before we start giving them, uh, uh, we also need to make sure that their kidney function is, is normal, is adequate. And we're going to give them insulin IV because it helps the glucose get into the cells and it will decrease the blood glucose level because the problem is that they're so unbelievably hyperglycemic. When the blood glucose level reaches about 250, we can add dextrose to their IV. Why do we want to add dextrose at this point? So they don't get hypo. Well, that's one reason, and they also need it for the kilocalories, for energy. So, nursing care, what are we going to monitor? pH. We're going to monitor their ABGs for sure. We're going to monitor their blood glucose level. We're going to monitor their potassium level, right? We're going to monitor their level of consciousness, their cardiovascular status. We're going to especially monitor their blood pressure because remember they're unbelievably dehydrated so they can have orthostatic hypotension, can't they? Mm -hmm. We're going to check the urine for ketones because that blood sugar is greater than 300, isn't it? So we're going to check the, blood, uh, the urine for ketones and we're going to keep intake and output on them. I think diabetic ketoacidosis is so interesting, especially if you're if you're into fluid and electrolytes, and I love fluid and electrolytes. Okay. I think I've said everything I need to say with that. And I didn't move on with the <laughs> All right, let's talk about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. This is with your type 2 diabetic. Your type 2 diabetic. They also are very, very hyperglycemic, and their blood glucose level can be greater than 1,000. Greater than 1,000. This one says, well, that gives you the osmolarity. Their blood osmolarity is increased also, greater than 320. Uh, osmos. It also says blood glucose is greater than 600. Hmm. It also says blood glucose. Yeah, but it can be up to a thousand or more than that. Yeah. This is both both diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state are life threatening. The patient can die. Uh, this one is a slow onset. And this one also, the patient becomes severely dehydrated because of the os osmotic diuresis. They have an altered level of consciousness. The mortality level is high. Uh, an infection is the most common cause of it. 
they have they're confused they have changes in level of consciousness if you have a diabetic that has a change in level of consciousness that should be reported immediately they can have seizures they can go into a coma and they can die they are severely dehydrated because of the hyperosmolar diuresis again the body's compensatory response to that hyperosmolarity of the blood is to pull fluid from the cells into the interstitial spaces and then into the intravascular space. Okay, so these patients are admitted to the hospital and the goal is to correct the fluid and electrolyte imbalance. They give them insulin IV. We give them insulin IV because we want the glucose to get into the cells. We have to monitor them for hypoglycemia once we start treating them. Give normal saline to rehydrate them. And of course we're going to give them insulin IV and then we need to monitor for hypoglycemia because we're giving them insulin IV. Monitor the potassium level because it may drop once insulin has, has started. Because it, remember when I talked about when the uh, potassium will move out of the cells, then once you give them insulin, the potassium is going to move back into the cells. You need to monitor their cardiac status. And if they need potassium replacement, you can give that. Of course, it's based on what their potassium level is. But if the doctor orders it, you need to make sure that kidney function is adequate before you, you start the potassium. This is true in any patient. If you're going to give them a potassium replacement IV, you need to make sure that kidney function is adequate before you do. Because what's going to happen if the kidney function is not adequate? Does anybody know? what? what can, hmm? mm -hmm. It's, the potassium is going to build up because in patients that have renal failure, they can't filter out that potassium and they, they have a high potassium level. Again, when the blood glucose level reaches 250, we can add dextrose to their IV. So this is also a life-threatening situation. Both of them are. Make sure you know these two because there's questions on the test about them and make sure you know the difference between them. Look at this, this is to help you remember. If they're hot and dry, the sugar is high. If they're cold and clammy, they need some candy. That means the sugar is low. Okay, the nursing process. We'll just quickly look at this because we also always have to look at the nursing process. If you have a diabetic patient, you want to look at the nursing history and the laboratory data. Uh, of course, for laboratory data, we're going to look at the glycosylated hemoglobin. Does everybody know that that means hemoglobin A1C? Glycosylated hemoglobin. You're going to look at the fasting blood glucose and the oral glucose tolerance because all of those are help you helps the doctor diagnose. Uh, diabetes. Um, as far as their physical assessment, these are some of the things you're going to look at. You want to look at height, the weight, vital signs. The, the, what's their sensory ability of their extremities, their peripheral pulses, their skin and their mucous membranes. For older adults, you need to look at normal aging changes. We're, going, we're looking at things across the lifespan here for children, uh, physiological status, their hydration, vital signs, and also look at the family. What are their strengths and weaknesses? How do they cope? What are their educational needs? And here are some possible nursing diagnoses. Risk for injury, risk for impaired skin integrity, risk for infection. Knowledge deficit, certainly that would be true with your new diabetic. Risk for deficient fluid volume, sexual dysfunction, ineffective coping. <clears throat> and here's your plan. The client describes how to administer medications. 
strategies for reducing infection, demonstrates meal planning, proper foot care, how to monitor their blood glucose levels. And I'll, here's one of the nursing diagnoses, risk for injury. Uh, monitor and teach the family about diabetic ketoacidosis and hyper, uh, hypoglycemic, uh, uh, hyperosmolar hyper, hypoglycemia in a client with type 2. Teach them the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and how to treat it. Impaired skin integrity, we've talked about all that. Teaching them foot care, foot hygiene, if they smoke, stop. Maintaining their blood glucose level, how important that is. And here's some pictures. Look at those orchids on the bottom of that, that, those two feet. Ugh. What are the things, did you see that top one? You need to teach them to look between their toes. That's one of the things you also need. And see the mirror. Risk for infection. Remember I said that uh, sometimes diabetic, especially women, will present with a yeast infection and they, that they finally figure out the patient has diabetes. So you need to teach them the signs and symptoms of infection. Teach them to wash their hands. Skin care. Dental care is really important for your diabetic because they can have periodontal disease. And down at the bottom for women, symptoms of candida. And then some things that can, you can teach them about exercise, about diet, how to monitor their glucose, about their medications, complications, foot care, sick day management, all those things. And you need to think about adapting your teaching to special needs if you have a child or an older adult. and sexual dysfunction. I think the one for uh, referrals as appropriate is the most important thing because I, I don't know about you all, but I don't feel like I'm adequately educated to teach a patient about sexual dysfunction. They need to go to somebody that knows a lot more than I do. And of course, coping is important, problem solving, coping mechanisms, and of course, evaluation. And then that's our last thing. Okay, what I'm going to do is I had a case study planned for today, but we didn't give it to you. So I've got them, I've got them printed out, and I'm going to give them to you, and I'm going to send you home with them for homework. And we're going to talk about them tomorrow, and that's going to be part of our review. One of them is about the child, the diabetic, the child diabetic. And this one, and so I was reading over it today.